right, so you guys, you warmed up for the first half of the day. Um, and now we're gonna talk about bulletproofs. Um, is there someone here who doesn't know what bulletproofs is? Great, okay, so we should start with that. Um, so um, I will apologize in advance. I will not get to the end of this, uh, all my slides today. Um, instead, what I will do is I'm going to take a top-down approach where we look at what bulletproofs is, what they solve, um, how they are helpful. Then we're gonna look at how they work. Uh, and then we're just gonna go all the way down in the rabbit hole and just go from there and up. So it will start very, very dark and then get brighter as we go. So the idea is that as you leave here, you're gonna be like, yeah, I still don't know what bulletproofs are. But, but you're gonna be, have the tools to figure it out. Um, so that's kind of the goal here today. And um, as we go, I think it's kind of boring. I think you guys are pretty tired and I'm pretty tired too and my voice is dying. Uh, so things are not great. But um, what is great is that we are going to be doing some fun things here uh, on the right hand side where I will actually do all of the proofs and stuff that we're doing. So we're gonna do certain knowledge proofs and we're going to actually do them for real um, computation wise. And we're gonna see that these two uh, expressions actually do match up or don't. Or we make a fake transcript and it actually works. Stuff like that. So that's gonna be fun, I think. Some of you may have installed this tool. It's called Aside. It's a tool that I wrote, actually, for the purpose of learning this stuff. Um, so it's very um, narrow, in a way, uh, use-wise. But, um, but it, it can be helpful in these situations where we wanna try this stuff out. So, yeah. But if you have SageMath, I recommend that instead. When I announced this tool, people told me, why aren't you using SageMath? And I was like, because I didn't know it existed. So anyway, uh, bulletproofs. So to start with, you've already been told about this um, um, particular slide. Uh, so most of what I'm talking about today is based on um, Adam Gibson, also known as Waxwing. He made a fantastic from zero knowledge to bulletproofs uh, write up, which is about 45 pages long. The bulletproofs paper is also 45 pages long, which is kind of interesting. But um, anyway, he's going through how he learned about zero knowledge proofs and he's kind of teaching you how to do it on the way. And I'm going to go through kind of how he saw this and kind of trying to wrap it up in how I see it. So you're gonna see someone seeing someone seeing someone doing something, uh, namely bulletproofs. Anyway, so um, this is the agenda. As you can see, we're not gonna get through all this today. We have one hour. Um, but we're gonna get through, uh, I think, at least half of it. Uh, but um, in particular because you guys already knew, uh, uh, you already learned about zero knowledge proofs in, in uh, John Newberry's talk this morning. Uh, so some of the stuff that we're talking about here you've already seen uh, and you've had it explained once, so I'm going to explain it again. Um, so hopefully it, it will stick a little more. Anyway, so bullet proofs, top down. Um, so bullet proofs, address a particular problem. Um, to get to that problem, we're gonna take a few steps together here. So, um, so background here, fungibility um, is necessary for money. So fungibility is where I have, I have a $1 bill and another $1 bill, and if these two were somehow worth different amounts of money, then uh, the dollar would be worthless as a, as a currency. It would not be useful as money. Uh, and in the same way, if I have a UTXO and another UTXO of one Bitcoin, and this one is somehow worth less or more than this one, then that is a problem. Uh, and money must not work that way. This one Bitcoin must be equally value to these other Bitcoins. Um, so, Bitcoin has a problem because um, it's not very private. In fact, it's one of the least private currencies that exist. Uh, and this is because the ledger is completely public. We can all check where every coin originated back to the dawn of time or to the mine, mining uh, coin based transaction where it came from. Um, or mining transactions, I should say. Uh, so anyway, the problem here is, um, so, oh, sorry, we have a problem here. So uh, the anonymizing users on blockchain is easy. Like I said, we can track coins and stuff. 
Uh, and if we de-anonymize users, we can say, oh, this is a guy who, um, he, was, he has money from this drug de dealer, right? Well, it sucks to be him, right? He, he's, he's been doing dealings with a drug dealer. He deserves it, right? Well, the thing is, like, I give you a Bitcoin. Oh, okay, I give you a thousand dollars. I'll give you ten dollars worth of Bitcoin, right? And you're like, great. And you use this together with your one thousand dollar worth of Bitcoin to spend, pay someone else ten one thousand ten dollars, and suddenly you you're you're screwed because you have now tied these two together, and you had no idea that I was previously buying from or selling to a drug dealer, right? So it's absolutely out of your control, uh, and there's no way for you to look this up, right? So, so this, is, this is a real problem, and it's a problem for everyone, not just drug dealers. Um, and one solution here is to use something called confidential transactions. And what they do is they hide the value. They don't hide it, the addresses, they just hide the value. So if I'm sending to someone, you don't know how much I'm sending. You just know I'm sending some amount, right? Um, why, does, why does that help? Well, it helps because the way that you can do analysis uh, and de-anonymization on, on uh, uh, blockchain transactions is by looking at the values and seeing who's sending how much to whom and when and how. You can see, for example, if someone is spending a big chunk of money, sending a big chunk here and then sending a small amount here, you can be pretty sure that this big amount is the amount that being paid and the small amount is the, this change going back. So you can link this change back to the same user, right? You can do all these kinds of things um, to tie people uh, and addresses uh, or using cells on the blockchain together. Um, so the problem here, though, is that confidential transactions are freaking huge, um, like several kilobytes huge. Like you would be spending 10 times more in fees to send a transaction on the Bitcoin network if you were using confidential transactions today. So the solution to this problem, well, one solution to this problem is bulletproofs. So what they do is they make these confidential transactions smaller. They also make them smaller if you aggregate them, which we'll get to a little. Um, but aggregating basically means that you're doing coin joins or whatever. You're at, you're, you, you are together with other people adding, adding together uh, your, um, your transactions, which makes it almost impossible to see who's sending to who because everyone is just mishmashing together with each other. Um, so what bulletproofs are, roughly, is they're an optimization of another uh, of, of, a, of a number of other people's um, work, and well, um, well, this is actually not technical new in bulletproof, but they can also prove general arithmetic. Uh, well, they can do, they can prove general arithmetic circuits, which which actually Boodle's work also can do, but bulletproofs can do that too, which is pretty cool. So uh, we're not going to talk about that at all. So okay. So, general idea is you um, replace something called the inner product argument to reduce the communication by about a factor of three. And you're like, okay, what does that mean? Well, we'll get to that. Um, but basically what it means is that we're cutting something into one third, and, and that is the optimization. We're making it a third of its original size. So the Boodle guys had 1,000, well, 3,000 kilobytes or 3,000 bytes, and then the bulletproof would be 1,000 bytes. That's all you need to know about that. So, but there's something called inner product argument, and we're going to talk about that uh, perhaps in detail, depending on how far you get. Um, we also there's a it's detailed thing, but we need really we don't need to um, implement commitment opening algorithm in the verification circuit, and that all makes no sense at all right now. But um, Basically, we're optimizing. We're making things simpler, and we have to do less. And this is what bulletproofs are. Um, they're building on a 2016 paper by Bootle and others, and they're making it smaller, and they're making it so that you don't have to do equipment opening algorithm implementations. And there's some other stuff, some fancy multi multiparty stuff, like if you, like I said before, if you are 100 people, um, for every person you add, the build proof only grows logarithmically. So it only grows, um, it only grows very little as you add more people. So for everyone involved in this coin join, whatever, it actually is beneficial to have more people. You pay less money to be more secure, which is or to be more private, which is 
which is a pretty good um, privacy feature. Um, and there's also some helpful specifics in the paper itself. They're talking about range proofs, for example, which is um, something that is uh, an integral part of confidential transactions. We'll talk about that, too. Um, as you see, there's lots of cover here. So. Um, okay, so the general idea behind that, and, and by, by, by what I mean when I say that, I'm talking about um, Bootle, the 2060 paper by Bootle, and they're building on a 2009 paper by some other guy, uh, and what they do is they take the, the, the communication complexity is, is from square root proportional to logarithmic. And the general idea behind the general idea behind that is the Peterson paper about Peterson commitments. Um, if you don't know about Peterson commitments, and I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, by the way, um, is uh, well, Peterson commitments are vital and very easy to understand. They just sound scary for some reason to me. Um, uh, and um, anyway, so there's just a bunch of people that build on our people. So, so this 2009 paper is, um, they tweak the Peterson commitment a bit to give a public coin. Uh, we'll talk about what that is. Like I said, this is top down, so there's lots of things that we're gonna kind of have to figure out as we go. Um, and, um, Right, so this, like I said, this is gives a, uh, a square root of the uh, square root communication of the group element. So, okay, let's look at what Burpins are. Uh, summary here, they optimize computational transactions, which is built on something called range proofs. Um, and they uh, actually optimize coin joins, like they, they grow less and less the more people you add to them. So after the, you know, the tenth person costs less to add than the ninth person, and so on. Um, and so, both proofs are a significant advancement towards better fungibility in, in Bitcoin and privacy and uh, and a bunch of things. So, generally, everyone is excited about this. So that's why that's why they are being talked about so often. So, um, before we get into the bottom, bottom, bottom part, we're gonna go even further and go down to the seller of the bottom part and talk about some math. Um, before that though, like a small note, this is actually not hard. And uh, maybe I'm easily scared, I don't know. But, um, so there's a lot of things, right? Here, lots of things. And you're like, wow, that's a lot of things. I can, there's no way I can understand all these things. Like there's so many things, right? Um, like lots of variables, like alphas and omegas and sigmas, and you're like, wow, I don't speak Greek. I don't understand this. Uh, but that's not really the point, right? There's, what's happening here is this very tedious stuff. It's tedious. It's like pages and pages and pages of just doing something stuff. But the stuff itself is not as, uh, actually hard. It's, it's, it's actually pretty straightforward. It's just that you have to do all these things, and then you have to kind of understand why you do that, right? So... Um, Terminology can be scary and all those things. I'm, you know, um, Peterson commitment sounds super scary and, and, and stuff, but um, it's not scary at all. Like it's, it's very simple to understand. So um, curve points, we've been talking about this. I don't know if I even need to say this, but um, so scalar, just a regular number. It's not on a curve. It's not on X and Y coordinate, it's just a number. It's a huge number, like 32 byte huge, but it's, it's a number. Or well, um, can be, um, and if we, we can use a scalar, any scale, almost any scalar, as a private key. So um, we just take a random number and we just say, hey, "Here's my private key." Uh, and assuming it's sufficiently big, like if you take a number two when you use a private key, that's going to be pretty bad. People are doing it though, but um, they usually lose their money. Um, but if you have a huge random number with 32 bytes or 256 bits, then usually you're, you know, I mean, that's unbreakable, basically. Um, and you just take that number and you multiply it by the generator. Um, another terminology thing here, the G here, the big G, that's called the generator. It just turns some number into a curve point. Um, and um, so if you do this, it's actually, I wouldn't know, I don't know if I would say call this multiplication, but anyway, we use the position generator and, and the number to get a point on a curve. And this point is our public key. 
for the private key A. So, and what we can do, and this is not obvious to me until very recently, <laughs> I'm kind of slow, um, is that you can take two uh, public keys and, and, and you can add them together, right? So if you add them together, you get a third. So, AG, A, so A, the AG and BG, we add them together, right? And then we have the A and B, and we add those together. Now these two added together are actually the private keys for these two added together. Uh, so we have the private key and public key, and we can just add them together and add these together. And we have the, a new private key and public key, which is corresponding to both of them added together. Uh, now you might think, well, that's great. We can do multisig. Well, no, you can't, uh, because this is really broken when it comes to um, doing with someone you don't trust, because they can um, negate your keys and stuff. So, but, but remember that we can do this kind of stuff, and we do this kind of stuff a lot. Like, this is, this is kind of the, uh, the math that we use to, to just um, um, uh, to just do all the things that we're going to do in here. Uh, like when we do a verification, we don't have the private key. What we have is an, is an equation which we can uh, multiply by g, and if we do that, we get the public key-ish thing, which we can use to verify that something um, matched up. We've seen it with the Schnorr signature, uh, with the Schnorr identity protocol, and we're going to see it again here because I'm bringing it up too. Um, but anyway, so we can also subtract public keys together or in the private keys and do and this is exactly the same so we can do map on these things um, so one more terminology I want to bring up before uh, we need to talk about zero knowledge proofs is nums numbers so it just means nothing up my sleeve it means it's a number that I created and I don't know anything about it that that's all it means so usually the way you do this is you take you create a random number kind of like you would make a new private key, you make it the x-coordinate of, of a curve, and then you can, de you can get the y-coordinate because, you know, because, because you know the curve, and that works half the time. Uh, because sometimes it's not on the curve, which is, you know, then you just make a new random number and try again. Um, anyway, so nothing up my sleeve. That means I don't know, for example, I don't know the, the x here. I don't know that number. And I prove it to you by saying that I'm just taking the x coordinate is just a hash of my name is Kalle or something, because um, you obviously don't know the um, private key that corresponds to that. Anyway, um, so there's two things. There's um, I mentioned this earlier. Uh, I said something about inner product argument. So dot product, inner product, same thing. Um, they're written differently in different places. Um, the way I've seen them written are the two at the top here, like A and dot in the center, B. Um, another way I've seen them written, and this is in the bulletproof paper, um, is, is in, within brackets. Um, so so all, it, all it means is that you take, you have, two, you have A and B here, you have two vectors. You take the first entry in the first vector, multiply it by the first entry in the second vector, and then you add that to the um, second entry times the second entry, and so on. And you could be adding this up, as you see uh, at the bottom here. This is the dot product. So if you have two vectors of scalars, and you take the dot product of these two, you're going to get a scalar. You're not going to get a vector. Um, there's also something called a Hadamard, pro Hadamard product. I don't know how to pronounce that. but um, It's an A with a, with a ring instead of a dot. Um, and Instead of taking them and summing them together, you don't do the summation part. So you just have the, the first times the second as the first entry, the second times the second as the second entry, and so on, as a, as a vector. And we're, we're going to use this later on, but uh, it just, um, it's just these two. If you remember these two, then that's, that's helpful. Um, so um, yeah, A with a dot, or the A with rackets, A, B with rackets. Uh, is the dot product, and the other one is the Hadamard product. Okay, so um, so we have value that's secret, and we want to hide it. Um, so we start by saying x is our secret value. Um, I'm just going to make a random one here. Oops. Okay. Um, and now we have a public key for this secret value. If you want to, we can do that. That's a public key. You can also take the 
um, coordinates for this if you, if you want to. Those are those. Um, I'm going to actually. Yeah. Yeah. That's too much. Okay. Um, so, like I said before, G is the generator. In Bitcoin, <coughs> in Bitcoin there's only one generator, uh, usually. Um, and it's the one that we use to turn a private key into public key. But in, um, in Bulletproofs, we actually have a ton of generators. We're going to have a bunch of them. And um, the, the point with the generators is that everyone knows them, and, uh, and they are nums, numbers, which means that you can't know the, the underlying value that, turned, that created them. So um, I denote generators with capital letters, usually like here. And you also have a vector of generators, the, the capital H, no, the, the, the bold H here. Um, so, yeah, we're, they're, they're trivial to create. Um, you just set some random value to the X value, or actually you set some defined value to the X value, and, um, and you have them. So I can actually show you, um, if I do this, I can show you, wait. That's how you, well, that's actually kind of ugly, but yeah. You can you just take a point of, um, so point, it takes an x value. Chart of fx is just the chart of fx um, function. G is the generator. Plus plus e here is uh, concatenation. It's not the double list because that's or. Um, and just take some, uh, I'm just gonna take one here to show you something. Um, or two. Oh, oh wait, wait, wait. So if I do one, and then I do. Yeah. Um, so some of these don't work. Like I said before, sometimes it doesn't work. So if you take um, if you take the the generator and append a one to it, it's actually not a valid uh, curve point. But two. Um, I think two is, yeah, but two is on the curve. So sometimes this don't work. Uh, you just try another number. I have, here I have this, which is a list of, list of all the valid ones. Um, well, valid first 20 something. Uh, anyway, so, um, right, so back to hiding a value. Uh, so what we can do here, um, to hide x, um, we can just create a new random number and call it r. So we take a new random number. And then um, we have a nonce, a public nonce, which is just the, the coordinate for this value. And then um, we use x plus r as the point, like that. And since we can do, we can do math and arithmetic on these points and get the same public side, we, we, we can use this to um, to prove that we know x. Um, and often what happens is that we use uh, different generators. So instead of using g for both r and uh, x, we use h for like hiding generator for the r value, and we use uh, the, general, the regular generator for the x value or some other generator. Um, in this case, r, h, and, and g are both known to everyone. So, for example, here, uh, and this, again, uh, the, reason that's, the reason I'm mentioning this convoluted example is because this actually shows up later. Um, it shows up later and it, it looks scary, but all it's doing is it's just creating a new random value for each of these generators, and then it's just creating this complementary value S um, to A. So A is the value you wanna hide S is the complementary value. And so you just iterate through all the generators, create new random values out of thin air, and there you have it. You, you, you can use those two to hide, completely hide the value in A. So, and we do this a lot. So, um, so okay, so zero knowledge proofs. Um, first of all, some terminology here. There's, um, there's two concepts called hiding and binding. Uh, maybe they're Obvious, I don't know, but uh, hiding is when you don't know the value 
the value x. Uh, so you're making a commitment to a value, but the commitment does not show anything about the value. That's perfectly hiding. Some, some things can be partially hiding and stuff, but, um, and binding is, I make a commitment to, to a value, and then later on, I decide, wait, no, I didn't mean head, I meant tails. Um, so if I can change my head to tails without changing my commitment, then my commitment is not binding. Um, so it's binding only if I can't change my secret uh, after revealing the commitment. So hiding and binding, um, and it has been proven that you cannot have a commitment scheme that is perfectly hiding and perfectly binding. That's pretty sad, but we get pretty close. But we're gonna look a little bit at, um, at how that might work soon. But so, there's a correlation here with zero knowledge uh, proofs. And uh, we, um, I mean, you saw briefly Sean Newberg talk about how you can prove uh, zero knowledge uh, proofs and how the two, there's three criterias. Um, and so the hiding and binding properties kind of match up to these, uh, to two of these criteria. Uh, so the hiding property matches up to the zero knowledgeness and the binding with the knowledge soundness. Um, okay, so we're gonna start generalizing one plus two equals three here. Um, start, start slow, uh, we'll start simple. So what we have here is we have variables, we have operators, we have relations. Um, and well, first things first, like this is a, this is, if this is a commitment, I handed you this as a commitment, then it would be um, perfectly binding because I can't suddenly change any of these because you see the, all of them. You, you know one, two, and three. Um, and it's also, uh, but, it's, but it's completely un, not hiding. It's not hiding at all because you know the secret. So this is not very good for, pri for private keys. Um, so we could do this if you want, um, but this is uh, actually, um, this is actually perfectly, uh, perfectly hiding, uh, I think. It's very nearly perfectly hiding anyway. Uh, the problem is, of course, that it's completely unbinding. I can set x to whatever I want. I can set it to one or two or three or four, head, tails, whatever I want, and it will still um, be, be valid. So it's not binding, right? Um, if I do this, we're back to square one, it's perfectly binding again, but it's also not hiding because you just solve for x and you have x is one, right? Um, this is well, interesting, um, but it's not really um, helpful at all because you don't know either of these values, so you can't really do anything with them. Um, and we can keep going like this, so for example, in this case, um, we can derive it, okay, so A is B minus one. Okay, that's not very helpful here. Um, we can just say if something plus something is something. Uh, we can go even more abstract. Uh, but, but first I wanna see this, this one example. If I say that I have something, but I don't know what it is, um, but I add, to, add it to, to something else, uh, and then I minus, and I take uh, something third away from it. And I, can, and I claim that this is zero, and I commit that this is zero, then this is actually useful. Even if, even if I don't know anything about these values, the three values, if I can do this, I can also say that the first two values equal the second value. That's pretty close to um, a uh, confidential transaction, right? Like I can, I can hide the value here, maybe. Uh, so if I say that the inputs, all of the inputs on the left-hand side, uh, if you add them together, uh, and you take all of the outputs on the, on the right-hand side, uh, then, huh, well, even, even without knowing anything about the, the values, I know that I'm not overspending. I'm not spending more than I have, right? So that's useful. There's a problem, though. Can anyone see the problem here? What's that? Negative yeah, exactly, yeah. So I could say that minus one plus minus one equals, you know, um, minus two, and then I can create money. Uh, or minus one plus one equals zero, and I can create money. Um, so we don't, we, don't have, uh, we don't have a range check here. We, we don't know if we're overflowing, 
uh, or under or, or, go, or being negative. Actually, we can't really be negative here um, because these these are all absolute values. But we can do things like um, minus one being equal to the the uh, the, uh, the p value, I think it is, or m value. I don't remember. But uh, so, anyways, that basically becomes a minus one uh, in this case. So we could do negative values to fool the the viewer. So we can't. That's not that's not enough for any proof. Um, I'm going more into generalizing. Um, I'm generalizing. We don't even know what the operator here is, uh, and we have vectorized the uh, the values. So now we can do any amount of values, n values. Um, we can do a vector of these. Um, yeah. Um, anyway, so let's look at a, a, a commitment um, that works, and it's nearly perfect. It's nearly perfect. So if you have one already, then why talk about this for so long? But anyway, uh, so we have Peterson commitments, and they are very useful because they are information theoretically hiding uh, and binding under discrete logarithm assumption. So you heard about the discrete logarithm assumption earlier. Um, it's a very good assumption to make because if someone would break that, they would steal all my bitcoins and yours and everyone else's. Uh, so as long as everyone has their bitcoin, we can probably be pretty sure that these are um, th this assumption works. It's a big bounty at this point. Um, so I'm only going to do this under elliptic curve stuff. You can do Peterson commitment without elliptic curves, but I don't even know how that works. I only know about elliptic curves. So, um, so what we have is we have the two generators, G and H. G is the actual generator, and H is the hiding generator. We have R, which is our random value. We just make that up whenever we want to make a commitment. And then we have our value V. And this is well, like a private key or something. And we have a commitment, which we call capital C. So here's a commitment. C is RH plus B, BG. That's it. Peterson commitments. Um, scary, right? Look, there's like one, two, three, four, five things in there. And an equal sign, and a plus. Like, geez. Um, anyway, so yeah, this is not very hard, as you can see. Um, so, um, yeah, I can get, yeah, I'm actually telling you what they are, but. Um, Anyway, so yeah, so generators, uh, I'm just gonna recap here because I've been talking for a while. Um, generators are predefined, nums, uh, public, um, and commitments, they hide and or blind, uh, blind, uh, bind, it should be bind actually, some other value. So in Bitcoin, the public key, capital P, is a commitment to X, the private key. Uh, we don't usually say that, but uh, that, is, that is the case. Um, so, with Peterson commitments, there's something interesting here. Um, there's a homomorphism, uh, which means that, uh, like the example here, you have a function and you take x, and y, x plus y inside of it, or you take the function with x plus the function with y, and you actually get the same result. That's additive homomorphism. So, Peterson commitments have uh, additive uh, homomorphism. You can see R1, A1, and plus R2, the uh, commitment of R2, A2. It's just, as you see here, um, you just get R1 plus R2 times H plus A1 plus H2 times G, which is exactly the same as this commitment to both of them together. So this is an interesting thing to have uh, in mind. All right, I don't actually know these guys. Um, but they seem appropriate for what I'm telling you now. Um, and this is, so we have, if you dramatize your knowledge proofs a little, to make them a little more interesting and more uh, child-friendly. We, uh, we have uh, five characters, heroes and villains. So P is a prover. Um, some, some people call her Peggy for some reason. Um, anyway, she proves that she knows stuff, right? So she's a good, good, good person, usually. And then we have V, the verifier. He's like a cop who makes sure that the prover does what they do, right? Um, and we have E, the extractor, who's actually a torturer. Not as child friendly as I was hoping, but uh, the extractor basically makes P tell stuff, uh, tell secrets. And sometimes this is called emulator. I don't know if there's a dif distinction between those two, but anyway. We have the simulator, finally, who's also a bad guy, just like the emulator. 
uh, exactor, sorry. And the simulator is a conjurer of tricks. It's a bold liar, and they trick the verifier uh, in various ways. And then there's Oracle, no stuff. Um, I will not write these in these fancy mathcal backslash uh, ways. Uh, I will just write them as capital P D E S O. But um, I will use them with non-italic to separate them from um, uh, like public key stuff. Anyway, so um, we so we talked about this. These three criteria. I'm talking about them again. Completeness um, means that an honest prover must succeed in convincing the verifier. Right. Okay. We'll talk a little more more about this. We're actually going through go, go, going to go through a few examples. So. This is the one that makes the least sense, I think, at now, uh, right now. But um, uh, we also have um, something called zero knowledgeness, which means that you, um, no one learns anything. The, the verifier must learn nothing about uh, the secret from the proof. And then there's something called knowledge soundness, which is that um, unless P knows the secret, they should not be able to convince the verifier that they know the secret, um, right? So, so far, before I start going into what this actually means, um, I may not be able to answer them, but are there any questions? Are you awake? <laughs> Two people are awake, good, okay, I'll keep going until you guys fall asleep, all right. Um, okay, so, I think I've said this a couple of times now, but uh, this is not hard, it's just tedious. There's lots of like um, terminology and new things, lots of things. Um, so here's a transcript. The transcript is just a list of stuff that the prover and verifier tell each other. Um, as you can see here, A, B, C, and that just means that P tells V, A, and V tells, v tells P, uh, v and P, prover, verifier, no? um, V tells PB and P tells VC. Very straightforward. Uh, the order here is crucial. We can't just skip B and tell C and B or, you know, we can't have the verifier send B first and then prover sending A. No, no. First prover sends A and then B in that order, right? Um, you saw this with uh, John Newberry's slides. If you were asleep then, uh, sorry, if you're awake then, you can sleep now. Um, so um, this is a simple example of a zero knowledge proof scheme. And I didn't even know this was a zero knowledge proof scheme until I uh, read it. But so we have a secret X, we have a commitment Q, which is XG, and we have a transcript, which is capital RES. So the prover sends R, which is just the public value of the, of the K value. And K is just random, just random. And then V sends back E, which is also a random value. And then P sends K plus EX, we call it S. And then V verifies. So when you're verifying something, I write it as equals question mark. Sometimes question mark is above the equal sign. Depends on if I'm using uh, LaTeX or not. Um, so anyway, sounds good, right? Okay, let's do that. So I will make a new public key, uh, private key, I mean. All right, that's my private key. Uh, don't tell anyone. And then I'm making a new nonce, and then I'm making a commitment to that nonce. Uh, yeah, and actually I need to have Q as well. This is the public key. All right, so everyone knows Q. I'm now sending, as you can see, first thing I send, prover sends R, capital R. The verifier already knows capital Q, because that's my public key, so I send R. Um, now V creates E. Important that V creates key after I send R and says that to me. So now prover has sent E over back to me. Um, and now the prover calculates S, which is a K plus E times uh, X. That's S, all right. And now V verifies. So if everything is working according to plan, S times G should give the same value as R plus EQ. Okay, let's try it. S times G and R plus EQ. Look at that. That worked. 
So Schnorr is not broken. That's good. Um, side note here, not super important. This is an example of a Sigma protocol. And you're like, oh shit, that's super complicated. I, c I can never understand that, right? Well, a Sigma protocol, you know the Sigma sign? It looks like a backwards E. Um, the reason why they call it the Sigma protocol is because literally provers send something, the verifier sends something back, and then the prover sends something back. And that's, that's why they call it the Sigma protocol. That's the whole reason. I don't even know why they do that. Like, are they trying to confuse us? Anyway, um, so we have more Sigma protocols later. That's why I'm confusing you about it. So uh, anyway, so it's okay. So we talked about three features, uh, completeness and zero knowledgeness and uh, knowledge soundness. Uh, so we're gonna look at Schnorr signatures a little more in detail. And we're gonna first look at completeness, right? So um, you have a prover and um, I'm not even gonna read this, just read it. Yeah, I don't understand what I mean either. Um, so instead I'm gonna show you an example. Uh, if you don't have the password yet, ask friends. I'm gonna try to write big, because I know you're not close. I'm, no, I'm not going to give you an example of a zero knowledge proof that is retarded. But it will help you a little bit in understanding completeness. Okay, so the transcript goes like this. Ha. Transcript goes like this. Okay, maybe I won't show you this retarded transcript. Okay, wow, it's a red transcript. Okay, um, send you R, send you E, and send you Z, where X is the hash of Z. Okay, so I'm proving knowledge about X here. Okay, that's important. This is the private key. This, uh, yeah, this is, the, this is the secret I'm trying to prove. And so, um, but this zero knowledge proof requires you to send me um, the pre-image of X as a hash value. So we need to have the um, Z value, which is equal to the inverted hash of, X, of uh, Z, right? Um, but we can't do that, well actually X, sorry. But we can't do that, because if we could do that, we could break everyone, everything, right? So we don't, we don't actually know how to, we can't prove anything. We can't prove, even if we have X, we can't prove it. Um, this may not be all of it, but this is a part of soundness, the criteria. If we can't prove that we have X, even though we have X, the zero knowledge proof is broken, right? Okay. Um, so zero knowledge is a little bit more interesting. So the question is, does the verifier learn anything about the secret after the verification is done? After we convince the verifier that I know that we know X, do they learn? Have they learned anything about X? Um, so we already looked at the honest case uh, where the where the prover knew X. Uh, now we're going to look at the case where X does not know uh, where the prover does not know X, right? Okay, so we don't know X. Um, so now it's the simulator. I was talking about the simulator. They were, they were the conjurer of tricks, right? Now they're gonna take control over the verifier's execution environment and they're gonna be doing stuff with it. So what they do is they're gonna do time uh, leaps. So they're gonna create this transcript and they're gonna create it out of order. Okay, and we, I think you've talked, I think uh, John Newberg talked about this, but I'm talking about it too, because that's in my slides. Um, so, the simulator sets, uh, I'm just gonna actually go out here and then go back in. Okay, so simulator sets uh, S and E to random values. Well, I'll go through it first. And then they set R, capital R, to SG minus EQ. And then they set the transcript to these three values and say, hey, there you go. And the verifier goes through and it just sets SG and takes R plus EQ and, huh, worked, right? But the, the simulator does not actually know the secret but they can still make a proof for it, right? So let's see how that works. Let's make a random value. 
to make another random value to make, uh, oops. Uh, right, so we have S and we, oh, we have to have Q. Sorry, uh, so Q is some point. Um, uh, so we said S to uh, the R, we said S times Q minus E, or S times G minus E plus Q. All right, so we have the transcript. So V now checks S times G, okay. R plus E times Q. Oh, okay, so he knows X. Yeah, so obviously the reason why um, we could fool the verifier here is because we created a transcript out of order. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Serenologies and what? Um, sound, you mean knowledge on this or completeness? You mean this one? I was talking. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very good question, right? So how can you do that? Anyone know? Like any ideas? How did how did the simulator fool the verifier? that they knew the secret, even though they don't know the secret. Because I don't know what X is here. Because Q is just the SHA-256 of hello world set as the X coordinate. It's just, it's just, a, it's just some X coordinate random. Well, so the reason here is, and I was mentioning this before, if you go back to the transcript slide. So it's, I'm saying at, at the bottom, I'm saying the order is crucial. Right? You have to do this in order. You have to send the first one from the prover, and then the second one sends from the uh, uh, verifier. Uh, and if you don't do this in order, then you can fool someone. Uh, it doesn't matter. And also, in, in, uh, what this also means is that if someone is observing after a proof has been made, if someone looks at the proof that two, uh, the prover and verifier created, uh, it means nothing. Because the prover and verifier can be uh, working together to fool you into thinking it's a real proof. So the only way to know for sure is by seeing this in order, you have to do a then B, then C. If you do this in any other order, your proof is, 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 is uh, a pointless. Um, so here, the simulator created S and E first, right? So that's out of order. They should come last, they came first. And then you can just solve R, like capital R. You can just solve it. And the point here is, what you may be seeing here is that I don't know what K is either. You know, the random nonce, the random value I use to create R normally. I'm supposed to use R equals K times G. I have no idea what R is in this situation. But I can fool you into thinking I do because all you, all you know is R. Uh, you don't know X. So I can just say, hey, here's R to uh, K value. So yeah, the order here is, is what matters. But so um, if you think about this for a moment, so okay, by changing the order of the transcript, I can create something that looks identical to a real proof, even though it's fake, right? Fake, real. If I take this behind my hand and I do this, you're not gonna be able to tell which one is which. They look exactly the same. And because they look exactly the same, and the only thing I did to make, to make a fake one was to change the order, it follows that you don't learn anything about the secret. Okay? All I did was change the order and I, f I proved to you something that was not the case. Changing the order does not create information, right? Um, there's a slight note about the distribution here. Don't really have to care about that. But there's a caveat, so uh, don't run out and start creating zero knowledge proofs without knowing that part. But anyway, um, okay, so zero knowledgeness and completeness. Any questions about zero knowledgeness or completeness? Okay. 
So last one, knowledge soundness. Um, this is kind of complementary to zero knowledgeness uh, in a way. Um, so now we have another evil guy, the torturer, remember, extractor. He now takes control of the prover and tortures him in various ways, or her. Um, Peggy, right? Yeah. Um, so what we do here, so the idea here is we, 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 we manipulate the prover somehow. Uh, and we manipulate the prover so that they tell us what X is. They tell us the secret. If we can do that, it means that the prover must have the secret. Because you can't tell someone something you don't know. So if I can force you to tell me the secret, that means you know the secret, right? Okay, um, so what we do is we kind of debug the prover. We can go back, we can go forward, we can kind of uh, restart, uh, and we can repeat stuff and copy states and stuff. So um, we look at the Schnorr identity protocol case again. Right, so, okay, question. Does P actually prove that he knows X or could he somehow fake it? Uh, we have RES and S is K plus EX and R is KG. Um, and extractor runs the prover uh, first point only. So he gets R. The extractor now has R. He has one R. And the extractor now saves the state. It saves it like a game, like a video game. You just save and then you can reload later. He saves and then he runs to the end. So he gets, he gives a random value E1 and he gets back a random, um, he gets back an S1. Right? He gave a random value, he, gave, he got back S. This is one round. He does this two times. So he gets a second one. But the, what he does is he now, uh, instead of going from the beginning, he uh, loads after he got the R. So now he has the same R, but he has, uh, he sends a different random value. So he has sent E1 and E2, and he's got an S1 and S2, and we can now solve for X. We can solve for X. That's pretty cool, right? Um, so, by just doing this twice, I can get your private key. Isn't that great? Um, so, these, so, okay, so why, how, how did I get your private key? Does it, does it just mean any, any ideas why I got it? How, how can I get it? Like, this is a normal, right? It's, okay, so here's a hint. It's the most common error that people do in cryptography. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, I reused the nonce, yeah. Um, because I reused the nonce K, uh, because I had the same K here, I can just solve for the, the private key. If K1 and K2 were different, we would have um, more, uh, unknowns, then we have equations. And we would keep having more and more and more. If I made this, did this 100 times, I would have 100 different Ks, so I would just have more unknowns all the time. So yeah. Um, so this, this proves knowledge soundness for the Schnorr uh, identity uh, protocol. Does, uh, is everyone uh, uh, okay with that? Does that work for you? Like, it's pretty convincing, right? I mean, if I can get the private key from you somehow, just by doing, going back and forth like this, it must mean that you have the private key. Right. How much time do you have? Five minutes, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, maybe when I, we can do, uh, I can continue this while we're drinking, at, no, never mind. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, Right, so to summarize these two, uh, the knowledge, uh, the zero knowledgeness and knowledge soundness. So I can prove the zero knowledgeness, uh, and the, the way I do this is that I manipulate the verifier. Uh, I manipulate them so that they believe that I have a proof, even though I don't. And if the two proofs, the, the valid one and the invalid one, if they are both um, indistinguishable, then um, you, can, you then that it goes, it follows that you have zero knowledgeness. I may be missing some subtle legal there. I'm sure that someone on, on Slack will. Uh, slap me, uh, if that is the case. Uh, and you prove some knowledge soundness by changing the, the uh, uh, by manipulating the prover, and we were debugging the prover, going back and doing stuff like this. Um, 
And by doing that, we, we, we made them reuse the nonce, which made them give us the private key. So, um, and it's important to note that you cannot use a fake prover to prove knowledge, because if you try to do that here, we actually can't do that, because this verifier was doing the transcript in a different order, right? The, the extractor was rewinding and going forward, so that requires that you have this time uh, linearity thing. Right. Um, yeah. So I'm going to talk a little bit about PDC commitments in vector form. I'm going to go a little faster now because I only have five minutes apparently, and I don't think this is the last slide. Um, so what we do is we take the PDC commitment, remember the the, the five things, uh, and we just expand it to take a vector instead. Um, so uh, here we have. Uh, um, R is, is one value, and but they have a vector that, uh, of V values. And important to note here is that this is not, um, this is the dot product. I, I forgot to mention that, but when you have vectors together like this, it it's implies that there's, there's a little dot in, in between. So this is the first V plus uh, times the first G plus the second V times the second G and so on. Um, and uh, we can go further, we won't, but we can. Um, so G, okay, yeah, G is a vector of generators. So, um, right, so to do this uh, in PDC commitments, we have to create a commitment for each of these vectors. Right, so we have M vectors. That's not M numbers, that's M number lists. So it's kind of like a matrix. Um, and so we create M Cs, M commitments, uh, the first R, plus the first x times the g. The generator here is the same. The h is always the same. We just keep iterating um, the uh, x's. So, so we created these commitments. Question, have we revealed anything by showing them to the world? The answer is no. Um, these commitments are still perfectly hiding, and uh, but they're not perfectly binding, only under the, um, the discrete logarithm assumption. So, okay, so we get a little hairier now. So we have a zero knowledge protocol for vectors, which starts with a C0. Um, and this is just a random vector. Uh, sorry, a random commi a commitment to a random vector, sorry. And then we have, as normal, the random E, and then we have two things from the prover, uh, a vector and another scalar. And as you can see, Prover sends Z0, verifier sends E, Prover sends Z and S, so it's a sigma protocol uh, example. You can Google that if you want. Um, so anyway, so the, the way we do this is we create Z and, and S in this fashion. We just, uh, remember E, the random value that the verifier sent us, we use that and we just take it uh, and we take it to the power of I. So for the first one, uh, we actually don't use it at all. In the second one, we use E, so an E squared, and so on. And we do this on both Z and S. So we get a vector and we get a scalar. Uh, and as you note know here, uh, we're actually iterating from zero here because remember we had C zero, which uh, is accompanied by the complementary um, uh, X zero vector, which is just a random vector, um, and the R zero, which is just, um, a random number. And um, so the verifier just does, um, it just takes a sum, EI times CI, um, and he checks that that is SH plus CG. Okay? Is it? Well, um, we can look a little, we can, we can take the right hand side and we can just do this. And we see, yeah, okay. That, that works, right? Yeah, that's kind of like how it goes. Like you're like, ah, oh, huh. yeah, that's right, okay. And you keep doing this like over and over. Um, so um, this is actually, um, well, this is actually a completeness uh, proof because you can see that they always match up. Um, so there's zero knowledgeness here. Um, what we do is, we do the same thing we did before. 
except we now have a vector instead. So the simulator, you know, the guy who's tricking people, he just fakes a transcript. So he just solves the random C0. He sets it to S plus DG minus uh, this sum here. And you just make Z and S up as you want. It looks, it looks really like weird and complicated, but I mean, he's just making up shit and it works, right? It's just, it just like simply just slap it together and there you go. And zero knowledge is all, like, it's all about just slapping things together or making things so hard that you get tired, right? Um, what, I mean, what I mean by that is I'm talking about the squeeze log, uh, log assumption where it's like, you cannot prove this, it's possible, but well, you cannot prove that this is the case. But you can prove that this is so hard that it would be easier to just try to find Satoshi's private keys, right? Uh, which works, I think. It's good enough. Um, anyway, I, I'll talk a little bit about lonely soundness, then I'm going to call it. I would have liked to talk about inner product stuff. Um, there's, uh, but I don't think that's going to happen because I think you're all getting pukey at me now. Uh, uh, anyway, so. Um, Knowledge soundness. Now, remember what we want to try to do here. We want to prove that the prover has these vectors, the x vectors, right? And how do we do that? Well, we make them give it to give give us all of those vectors, and we do that by just um, running back and forth and just debugging the prover uh, with a a C zero that is the same. So. Um, by having a non-random C0 or the same C0, we could just do this enough times, and we eventually we have uh, uh, more uh, equations than we have unknowns. There's going to be a lot of them, but I mean that's okay. We have time, right? Um, so then we just solve the linear equations, and we get all of these x values out. I told you in the beginning, this is tedious stuff. This is really tedious, but, but it's not hard, right? It's not hard at all. It's just, you just do this stuff, and you're like, okay, I'll do that 100 million times, and then, okay, well, you know. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm not gonna talk about this. If you really, really have not tired of me yet, which would surprise me a lot, then uh, you can ping me, uh, we can sit down, and I can show you uh, about the inner product zero knowledge proof. That's kind of the only really uh, complex, complicated thing that is left. Um, there's, um, well, sort of. Um, but if you know if you know about the inner product zero knowledge proofs, you you can probably just sit down with the with the paper and 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 especially if you have a wax wings paper, you be like ah, you know, it's not it's not as hard as it looks, and understand all of it. So um, yeah. Well, um, so it's binding in the same manner that a, a private key is binding. So um, if I can come up with a new private key corresponding to your public key, yeah. which is possible, right. it's very hard, uh, then if I can do that um, reliably, then we have a lot of big other problems to solve before we even care about that I think the entire system is going to break. I understand, but I just mean in, in relation to like this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What we're saying is that like right. binding essentially applies to the whole body. Yeah. So if it's broken, if you don't keep broken, then you can just play on forever. Well, um, it's only so okay. So um, so first of all, you cannot have perfect binding and perfect hiding. Right. Uh, right. Uh, you can only have one of them. Uh, and PDC commitments are like, um, they're perfectly binding under the discrete logarithm assumption, which is exactly the same assumption that you have for private keys and public keys. Right. Uh, so if we can break that assumption, then uh, everyone loses their money anyway. Even, you know, I mean, it's, it's, you're, you're kind of breaking more stuff than just this. Inflation is not going to be your biggest problem. Right. I think. I may be wrong. Someone on Slack will slap me if I'm wrong, I'm sure. Thanks. Okay. 
Oh, one other question. Yeah. Are, are we building, so do these vectors essentially uh, map to um, the commitments in, a, in the range proof? So like each commitment would be like the ring signature over a particular value? We, we, we don't use ring signatures. Um, so what we do instead is uh, we use the inner product to create a, um, a circuit that tells us, one, that our values are not overflowing, they're in within a certain bad amount, and two, that they, um, they don't exceed each other, right? Uh -huh. um, and we do, that by, um, we do that in a very, very obscure and, um, yeah, as you see, I have not gotten to the end of my slides, as you can see here. So okay, so range proof are here. So what we do is we actually, um, it's, it's, it looks like a hack. It probably is a hack. It could probably be more elegant, I don't know. But um, so what you do is you take the, the value and then you uh, create a vector where you say one or zero, right? So, uh, so you, you turn it into the uh, uh, log two, uh, sorry, the, the um, not the decimal, the binary value. And then you just take one, each one is, is, is the binary value of that uh, a bit in the, uh -huh. in the number. Uh -huh. um, and then uh, you um, create this other vector, which is it's called, uh, it's called uh, bolded two here. It just means uh, one, two, four, eight, 16, 32. So you, you get this representation of the number as a vector of ones and zeros. Mm -hmm. And then what you prove is you prove one that it's only ones and zeros. It's not minus ones or twos or anything. And you prove too um, that uh, it's uh, more than and less than a certain value. Uh, actually, I don't think you prove that it's more than a certain value. Actually, you just prove it's less than a certain value, which is like it's, it, it doesn't have more than 51 bits or something in it. Mm -hmm. um, and then you use that to just do um, arithmetic. So it's it's well, uh, um, so once you get the inner product stuff, you can use that to do this kind of stuff. And when you can do this kind of stuff, you, just, you kind of take this. So there's like steps and steps right. uh, all the way. If you, I, I can show you my slides and we can go through it if you want. Um, but I don't think I have time anymore. I think they're going to throw me out of this. So thank you. All right.